Hello. Um, we're going to get started. We've got a couple of people still missing. Um, I wanted to introduce Rebecca. Rebecca Weintraub is a professor here at Annenberg. She is in charge of the communication management program, and Rebecca is also the lead project manager on uh, the strategic communication workshops that we do for the U.S. government. And so uh, she and I have been working on strategic communication for years now. Many. Many, many. <laughs> many years. It's not so. fixed yet. <laughs> <laughs> we keep hoping, though. We, someday we figure we'll put ourselves out of a job, but oh. it hasn't Or we'll reach yet. retirement. We don't know which we come first. <laughs> One of, one of those things. And so Rebecca has a, a really interesting background. She went through the academic world um, and got her PhD actually here, went off, taught for a while, and then decided she wanted to make real money and joined the corporate world and was in the corporate world for how many years? About 17, 18 years. 17 or 18 years and then we needed somebody to run executive education and communication management and so back when I was the director of the school I, I hired her away <laughs> and brought her back. And now I live in poverty. <laughs> 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 and communicators. That's true. Absolutely true. So what we are going to do is we're going to talk to you about some of the theory, some of the application, lots of different examples where we're going with the research in this area. We are very evidence-based, and so we've got lots of people who have been through trying to use this model of communication, and so now we're following them. And we continue to keep track of what's working, what's working well, what's not working as well, where do we need to give people more instruction, different instruction, uh, just trying to work our way through all of these things. If you think about communication, you think about something that people believe happens naturally. And that is the biggest problem, all right? Everybody thinks of communication as something that just happens. And some people have it as a job and other people just sort of do it. But very few people are actually good at thinking about communication strategically. And so yesterday, um, Michael Della Carpini talked about this notion of communication at the core, communication at the center. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to flesh that out a little bit. What does that really mean? We talk about the big problem, right? One of the things that you learn very, very clearly from Francois' talk is that the change is big, the change is rapid. There are all of these new communication platforms that are out there. There are all of these ways that people are becoming very connected. The problem is, in this very rapidly moving world, highly connected groups, organizations, and governments are not designed for this new environment. They were probably not great communicators before when everything was slow and deliberate and small and relationship-based. And now, in this new environment with all these added expectations, it's just gotten worse. And so one of the things that we've been noticing is that when you do surveys of organizations, in the past, communication would come up as something that probably wasn't great, but often was sort of in the middle. Now, when you see these big studies in large organizations, what's the worst thing in the organization? It's almost always something around communication. And so people say they don't get information or they don't get it fast enough to do their job. Uh, there are lots of conflicting pieces of information, et cetera, et cetera. And so we've been working really hard on how to identify these issues and make it better. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is we've tried to help people think about all of the ways 
in which we can parse communication. And so we have to understand how it fits into a larger environment, and that larger environment might be a technology environment. So what does it mean to be in the Twitter space, right? What does it mean to be in cyberspace? What does it mean to be in any of the variety of environments? In this class, you've been talking about lots of different ways to construct an environment, right? You've been talking about sort of the political environment. And then um, Ed yesterday was talking about institutions, right? And he said, oh, I don't really want to go there because it's so hard to describe, but I, I'm just going to take a minute to say, think about institutions in a way that allows us to look laterally across lots of related <coughs> organizations. Examples might be something like education, right? Where in the United States, we do have something very interesting going on in education. This whole notion of scores, and that we've got all these different ways in which teachers and students are being rated and ranked constantly on all these various scoring systems. And so that would be thought of as, you know, the larger environment, this environment of accountability is what everybody's calling it. There's this whole new branch of education <coughs> called accountability education. And so that might be an example of how you can create an environment that would then impact organizations and structures. Now sometimes there's this mediating thing called culture, and culture could be a variety of things depending on what you want to make it in your particular analysis. And we're going to be very analytical today. Rebecca's going to go through a, a, a session in here where we're drilling down and we're saying what do we know exactly about these people, these organizations, this issue. So environment and organization are sometimes mediated by culture. So there are <laughs> cultures that might push back on the scoring system in education, right? Who might push back on that? Pardon? Teachers? Teachers. Lots of teachers are not sure that this is a great way, you know, to run the educational system. And so you might find a teacher's union that's really pushing back. Where, where else? Parents might push back. And so you might have activist parents. Where else? Students might push back, where they think that, it, that teaching to the, all of these tests is depriving them of creativity. All right, and free expression. And so there are all different ways in which a culture might manifest itself in some areas. If you get some of these stakeholder groups to work together, you find that there are schools that will opt out. And they'll say, we're not going to do this. We're going to do something else. We're going to be accountable in different ways. Culture could also be intercultural issues. One of the things that we've seen in LA is that in areas that are heavily Hispanic, you start to see people pushing back against the structure. You also see huge differences across countries, right? If you look at you know, who really teaches to tests, if you are a student in China, you expect that what happens to you in your life depends on how you score, right? There are other places. The UK is a very good example of a place. You know, what happens to you on the A levels? All right, there are places where this is just built into the culture. And then there are places that are pushing back dramatically. So one of the things that we have to do is we've got to figure out what are all of the things that are going on that are going to impact our message, our message strategy, and how it is that we communicate and the platform through which we communicate. When we think of media, what's the first thing that pops into your head when you see the <coughs> word media? Television. Television and newspapers, right? But what are the other kinds of media now that we need to worry about? All the social media issues. And I didn't hear it. Internet, right. Okay. Social networks. Social networks, absolutely. And so we've got way more kinds of media that we need to monitor. 
Um, later on, if we have time, I'll tell you a, a, a sad story about people who didn't know how to monitor the media. Networks. When we talk about networks, they could live at lots of different levels, right? It might be a very close, social, familiar sort of network that's important in one strategic communication case. What else might it be? What other kinds of networks? The teachers are an example of folks who are really good at networking. Professional, unions. Professional groups, unions, and so there are lots of people where that network is pretty standard. Okay, now one of the things that Sheena was saying yesterday is that we need to do a much better job of building networks. And both Ed and Cabby were talking about how it is that you leverage networks, even networks that aren't very strong. Sometimes what you're trying to do is make them stronger. Sometimes what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the strength of a network, right? Depending on what it is that uh, is your challenge. What's the difference between a coalition and a network? Why do you think we separated that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Parties could be from different uh, spectrum of, of the society. All right, because it could be that they layer differently. It could be that you've got a coalition that cuts across hierarchies. They could be time bound. Lots of coalitions come into existence for an issue. They run the course of the issue and then they dissipate. That's what Manuel Castor was talking about yesterday, right? That what you need to do is you need to think about moving your coalitions into a movement because the coalition might go poof as soon as an agenda is done, an election is done, something like that. And so we're always talking about trying to move from coalitions to networks. Stakeholders. We have stakeholders at the bottom, but also at the very center of all of these layers. And so that's because the whole approach that we take is stakeholder-centric. One of the things that strategic communication is all about is the idea that the most important information and message is not what you are trying to say, it's what the stakeholders need to hear. All right? And when you put stakeholders at the center, it flips the background of a lot of the research that's done. Because an awful lot of research, particularly in public relations, is done very much from the notion of people who are the mouth organs for a different company, a different educational system, a different government, right? And so this concept says that we're looking at stakeholders, we're looking at multiple stakeholders, some of whom won't agree with each other, but in any given situation, we have to figure out who are all of the different people that we need to talk to. And so one of the things that's really important is that you understand your own communication philosophy. When I left a little bit earlier, I had to go interview someone. We have an opening for the Vice President of Student Affairs. And I'm serving this year as the president of the faculty at USC, and so that makes me automatically on the search committee. And so sort of in the middle of this interview, I said, so what's your communication philosophy? Oh, you're cruel. <laughs> <laughs> and he stopped for a moment, and he, and he did a good thing. He said, well, what exactly do you mean? And I said, are you a wait and see communicator? Are you a get out in front of it communicator? Are you a openness is good communicator? Are you a we need to be very careful and very moderate and very conservative about communication? And he was actually very good because uh, he's, he's advising all of the people on the search committee as he talks and gives examples about how you have to be open, but at the same time, you also don't want to leave a story. And gave some very good examples that you know probably wouldn't be meaningful because they're very US-centric. But he, he gave a couple of very good examples. 
he understood the notion of the communication philosophy. What, tell people the communication philosophy story that you used okay. in, the, in the Navy workshop. Um, when I was at, uh, I was in an aerospace company that no longer exists, it's not my fault. And, uh, <laughs> but I was the director of employee communication and executive communication. And I, I was the first person to hold this job because we had never, nobody ever thought that was important. We had a new CEO. And he decided, and, and, and the reason he created the job was that he believed that we should communicate to employees first. Um, and he, because um, when he came, uh, somebody said, how do, you, you know, how do you communicate to employees? And the answer was, that's what the Los Angeles Times is for. <laughs> so that yeah, kind of defeats purpose. So anyhow, one day I get an email, and probably not an email back then, probably a carrier pigeon, mm -hmm. from my counterpart who did media relations saying we have reason to believe there's going to be a story in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow, and it's going to be about such and such, and we're not commenting, we didn't, you know, there, it's, it's pure speculation, and, and we knew it was something that was going to upset the employees, and employees do not understand how the press world work. Back then, they don't understand now. They think if there's something about your company, it's because you issued a press release. The notion of investigative reporters means nothing to employees. So this was a potential, going to be a potential upset. So I wrote a, a memo to all the employees, basically saying we have reason to believe there's going to be an article in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow. Um, it's pure speculation. We have we have no comment. We've issued no press release. And then I did. This will tell you how long ago it was. A fax blast all over the world. We have we have people and facilities everywhere with this. And I did all of this. I got the first notice at three o'clock, and by four fifteen. Pacific time, it was out. So that night I'm getting together with some friends who are in the same kind of business. You know, you know, you say, oh boy, what a day, and I'm telling this story. And one of the women looked at me and said, how did you get the lawyers to approve that that fast? And I said, I didn't ask them. <laughs> and she said, are you going to have a job tomorrow? And I said, what do you mean? I mean, you can't just send something to all the employees without having the lawyers look at it. I said, uh, I, I did not use this phrase, we didn't use this phrase back then, but basically I said, the chairman's got my back. I know that my, our communication philosophy is employees first. You know, and as long as I'm not violating the law, like if there's an SEC regulation that I, you know, the Security Exchange Commission, I couldn't do it, but that wasn't this. I said, so I, you know, I just did what I'm supposed to do. Now, the end of the story is, I did still have my job the next day. But guess what there wasn't the next day? No there was no story to look at. <laughs> but I know, if I hadn't sent out that fax blast, yeah. there would have been. Yes. There's a law of physics that governs yeah. that. <laughs> but but, but in, in all seriousness, I didn't have to go ask anybody. Because I had been in the job long enough, had enough experience to know this was not something where we were in danger of violating, you know, insider trading laws. And, and that it would be um, an upset to the employees because the chairman has been telling everybody, we will communicate with you first. And so it was a way of ensuring that we would build that kind of, continue to have that kind of trust, you know, with, with employees. But um, I won't pretend that I wasn't a little worried. <laughs> <laughs> the key, the key to that story is she knew what was the right thing to do, and the communication philosophy lets you know what's the right thing to do, and you don't have to micromanage everybody, because people each know what they're supposed to do, how to communicate. It doesn't mean something won't occasionally go wrong, well, I mean, right? I, I, um, I, about two years later, um, we were going to be announcing the closure of a plant, and we were actually doing the big satellite broadcast from that plant, which, and people knew that that's what we were going to be doing, so it happened on a Monday, and you know, a lot to do. This was before streaming video, you had to have big satellite trucks. And I, people said to me, well, we know that the plant that's not going to get closed is Fullerton, because you wouldn't be going to Fullerton if that was the plant you were closing, and of course it was. But, um, a, one of the people on the team decided that he had to let the mayor know 
uh, beforehand. All, most of the calls were going out, you know, like at seven o'clock in the morning, and we were going live at eight. <coughs> and on over the weekend, he called the mayor, who called the press. So I wake up in the morning and I pick up my LA Times at five in the morning because I got to drive to Fullerton. Hughes is closing Fullerton plant. You do not know, want to know what I said. And you definitely don't want to know what the chairman said. Um, and what he had to do was get up and, at the beginning of this live session you know, to all the employees and basically apologize in the sense that, I'm sorry this happened, we do not know who leaked it. He then made the unfortunate statement that, and when I find out that person will be fired, <laughs> probably not the right approach, but people appreciated it. Actually, they applauded. Um, and, it, and it was a while before we figured out who did it. But the, but the point of it was, um, be, it, so even though we, we didn't, we tried to do what we said we would do, circumstances beyond our control happened, um, but by acknowledging it and explaining what happened, he actually bought a little bit more goodwill. Um, although, you know, when the CNN cameras and the radio, we talk radio cam um, microphones are right there as employees are walking into work and saying, so what do you think about this facility being closed? <laughs> it was not a good day. Yeah. But the good news is people understood from the talk, what the communication philosophy was. And what the plan was. He had intended the employees to know first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that everybody thinks constantly in an overarching way before we get down, you know, do the drill down to the details about what your communication philosophy is. What is it that you're trying to accomplish and how are you going to look at all of these different places that impinge upon that communication philosophy? And, and the, the philosophy comes down from the top and you have to be honest and true about what you're really going to do. So Obama, when he first became president, campaigned on and promised a transparent White House. And he wasn't able to, to do that. Now, chances are, nobody could do that. The, the place doesn't really lend itself to that. Um, but because he said that's what was going to happen, and it didn't, that has been an issue he's had to deal with over time. What most organizations do is they don't state their communication philosophy. But there's an implicit philosophy. If you want to know what your communication philosophy is, look at how your organization communicates. What some organizations do is they say, this is our communication philosophy, and then they do something over here. So that, that's a double whammy, right? Because you're not being true to what, what you said. Um, that's worse, I will grant you, than having an implicit uh, communication philosophy. But I would argue that you are better off with an organization saying, this is what our philosophy is going to be. And it may be perfectly appropriate if you're president of the United States to say, we, are, we cannot be transparent. The, the, um, the situations don't allow for that. And so we're going to do this, and this is how we're going to do it. So if you don't think that there's a state of communication philosophy for the organizations that you represent or work with, back your way into it. All you have to do is look at how do we communicate major information? How do we communicate low-level information? How do we communicate formally? How do we communicate informally? What do we reward people for in terms of communication? And probably even more critically, what do we punish? Because if you really want your leaders and everybody communicating, then it has to, it cannot be a zero tolerance for errors. Because if you are communicating, and you are openly communicating, somebody's going to say something that he or she shouldn't have. And if it's off with their head, then that will tell everybody else that you don't really want them communicating. So you need, you want to look at how all of that plays out. Does that make sense? And one of the things that Ed said yesterday that you don't want to forget 
It's also important how you're incentivizing communication, right? And if you think about that, that's something that almost no organization does. Very few organizations incentivize people for getting good at being a communicator. And there are very few organizations that say these are the communication activities that we want to take place and incentivizing people for doing those well. All right, it is very unusual. And so one of the things that we do is we proselytize for this, that it's very important. One of the things that happens when we're done with an entire workshop on strategic communication is lots of people say that their big takeaway is that their communication philosophy is being a strategic communicator. That what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to be stakeholder centric. They're going to try to get the data that they need in order to do their job. They're going to try to follow some of the methods that we're going to go over right now. And that they want everybody to think that way that there is a process around strategic communication that they want to build into their culture, all right? But almost all of them say that it's going to be a challenge because there are so few people who naturally think like this. And so Rebecca is going to go through the puzzle and she's going to talk about how it is that one thinks about this not in a very linear way, but in a way that's more holistic, more consistent with this, the fact that all of these things are embedded and interrelated. We're, we're, we've requested some copies of some of this because it might make your note taking a little easier. Mm -hmm. And Allie Allie's is gonna go, gonna go again, they should be ready. Okay, good. So, um, so Patty talked a little bit about how a lot of times um, when organizations communicate, um, it's about what we want to say. Um, so if you go to your organization or your leader says, we want a strategic communication plan, or we want a communication plan, what's the, what's the next thing that gets asked or gets said? Hmm? The tools, the the okay, the how to communicate? The what's the message? I, Generally, what you hear then is, you know, we, we have to put together a communication plan. What are our messages? So, who's the center of your world when you begin by saying, what are our messages? We are. We are. Yes, we're very Ptolemaic, aren't we? You know, the world goes all around us, as opposed to Copernicus, who said we go around the sun. So, what we're going to talk about today is, is as Patty said, shifting that. So this is the high level of the, of the puzzle model, of the elements. So we refer to the puzzle pieces as elements. The next slide will make your head hurt, which is the reason why we're getting you some copies. But these are the five elements that we think are critical to a strategic communication plan. Now, we call it a strategic communication plan because it is coming out of the organization's strategy. So the organization is trying to achieve something. So I'm going to use organization here in the broadest sense of the term. Okay. So what? So there's a there's a there's a strategic goal, initiative, plan, something we're trying to achieve. And then you'll notice in the middle, because we're stakeholder centric, we have the stakeholders. We have environment because the environment sets the context for what we're doing, doesn't it? Yes. So the same situation, the same set of circumstances is going to be very different if we're in a robust worldwide economy than if we are where we are today, right? So it's really important to understand the context. We do eventually implement one of the things that I tell people when I talk about this is um, don't worry about all of the analysis. So when we're over here, we're in the analytical phases. So when you're talking strategy, are you talking today or are you talking tomorrow? tomorrow. You're always talking tomorrow. You're always looking out. Um, I had one admiral who raised his hand during one of these workshops and said, 
Well, Rebecca, eventually you have to stop polishing the cannonball. <laughs> That's right. You know, it's an interesting you know, metaphor. Um, but here's the thing that I suspect you know that he didn't know because he's not a communicator. And that is that the pressure to get stuff out, the message, the video, the press release, the speech, the Twitter, the, you know, the whatever, is so intense that most of the times communicators if they have any time to strategize, you know, do it walking from one meeting to another. So you don't ever have to worry about getting to implementation. It is going to happen. Your challenge, I would argue, is to keep the, the tactics at bay as long as you possibly can. Because the, the organizational pressures are tend to be, until you get to um, our, our strategic communication philosophy nirvana, is you've got, you know, is to, yeah, but what's the stuff, but what's the stuff? Does that make sense? Okay? And then we measure the hell out of it. So let's now, go. And let's ask, how many of you currently who are doing communication in organizations spend moderate, not a lot, just moderate time really measuring the impact of what you're doing? Trying to. Try to. Try to. Try to. Try to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, that's good. That's actually great. That's, that's, you're, you're, you have now won the prize for all of the classes that we've taught. We've got about half of the people who say they're doing it. I don't think we've ever had half. No. And, and, and measure, measurement is hard in this particular kind of, of situation, okay? Because um, you're doing a lot of correlational data. You know, this, we did this and this happened. It's hard to get to the causative data. Um, however, if there's a way to do it, this woman can tell you how. Uh, uh, but some, uh, and I am, not, uh, I am not a quantitative sort of person. If God had wanted me to do that, she would not have invented calculators uh, or Patty Riley. But, but what I used to tell people when I was in the corporate world is if you're not sure, start by counting on the theory that when all else fails, more communication is gonna be better than less communication. Now, you don't wanna stop there, which is the problem. Most or many organizations stop there. But at the very least, you wanna be looking and saying, how will I know this is going to be successful? So, um, one of the reasons we came up with a puzzle as a model is because we don't think this is a linear process. We think some things have to come before others. And in the way the world works, you know, we tend to do this, and then we tend to do this, and then we tend to do this. But there isn't a, a direct line. So if we go to the next slide. But before oh, yeah. that, notice the puzzle piece. Oh, that's very good, yes. Yes. What's interesting about the puzzle piece? What do you know about puzzles? If you're going to build a puzzle, where do you start? You start at a corner, right? Mm -hmm. How many corners do we have? One. So, by definition, where do you start? Strategy. You always start with strategy. Uh, and then, if we go to the next slide, we're going to go into stakeholders. So let, but let's start with strategy. And so go to the page that you have that has all of the stuff. It'll probably be a little easier to see, maybe, maybe not. The colors might or might not match. So we start with the strategic effect. That's what's the organization trying to achieve. So what are the, some of the things your organizations are trying to achieve? 100% voter turnout. 100% voter turnout. Development impact. Meaning? Changes on the ground, improvement in people's lives. OK. What else? Give me that again. Net exporter of power. Okay. A net exporter of power by 2015. And I, none of you have your name tags up anymore, so all I, have to, all I can Luis. do is Louise. Balancing budgets. Balancing budgets. Balancing budgets. And Louise's again? Uh, changing people's lives. Improving oh, oh. lives. Improving lives, development, results, impact. Okay. 
Anybody else got anything else? Establishing the legitimacy of the institution. What's the, uh, the election commission in Iraq? It's establishing. Oh, the election okay. Commission. Establishing the organization's um, legitimacy. So, in that case, establishing the legitimacy, I would argue, is your strategic effect. What's your hundred percent turnout? Uh-huh. Hundred percent turnout is going to be your ultimate metric, isn't right. it? Mm -hmm. And the strategic goal is legitimacy. Okay, so those are good. I like those. Now you've got to figure out what's your strategic communication effect. So the strategic goal, here's the, here's the easiest way to look at it. The strategic goal will have more required to achieve it than just communication. So, but there will be communication. Now, every once in a while, you will actually have a strategic effect that is communication, but not, not very often. Um, so, so, if you're ever trying to figure out, well, where does it work, you know, what's the difference between my goal and my strategic goal, my communication goal, and my strategic goal, what are the other things that are going to have to happen in order to be able to achieve that? Okay, so just really quick. The net exporter of power. This is a really good example of something that is not a communication goal, right? What would be a communication goal for to be the net exporter of power? Okay, well you that's that's one of your sub goals. What's your communication your plan goal What's, going to be? What is your communication goal? Like, um, increase demand? Consumer increase, increase consumer demand is going to be a midpoint metric. It's not your communication goal. Increase awareness. Better flow of communication. Or? Oh, damage. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, you, I, I think the, the focus goal will be the internal communications for the uh, operators of power to get them to understand that the collective outcome is to be able to export it. All right, so you've got a two-stage problem, right? The first is exactly as Tunji said. You have to get the people who are producing it to understand what they're doing. Because otherwise, they're going to say, why should we work so hard? You know, the, the, the people here are, are happy and fine. The second thing you have to do is you have to be able to strategically convince buyers, the people who are going to buy your power, and this is what gets to the image, that you will be able to not just do it, but you will do it credibly with a quality level in a sustainable fashion for the long haul, because they don't want to shift to you as you know where they get their power if you're going to be crashing all the time or when things get tight they're going to go back only to the locals and the people farther away get cut off right so you've got an external message you've got a quality image but first you've got to get the inside people on board so it's a it's a big two-stage communication problem all right back to Rebecca. makes sense so what might be um, your um, established organizational legitimacy for the, for the, the RAC voting? Mm -hmm. So what might be your communication plan? Or your communication goal, sorry. Um, to have people believing that, uh, believing the election is credible. Okay. Okay. Now you're going to need more than just communication as part of that, right? Yeah. But that could, that could be part of it. What else might you do? What else might you do if your goal, so your goal is, uh, is legitimacy, which is going to be shown by 100? 100% voted to have free so, and fair elections. International observers saying that it's free and fair elections. The person who's got the most votes actually becoming the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your communication goal around that is probably going to be parsed by the process yeah. through which you are doing the various things you're going to need to do around the building of that um, credible election. So, you, so it's going to be you're, you're going to you may phase it as it, which is a little bit what Patty was talking about with what you would be doing regarding the oil exporting. 
So you're phasing it. So you might have, if you will, a strategic communication goal by each phase of what you're doing in the organization. And the reason that's important is because it will vary by stakeholders. Because remember, we're going to focus on, I thought I saw Ian. Sir, is that Julian? Yeah, as a professor was saying, I think uh, it's a, a too tired issue there because when we are talking about uh, legitimacy, is uh, I can see it from uh, an outsider, uh, the voter, but also from inside. How am I going to operate in order uh, to be seen, mm -hmm. to, to have my organizational my organization legitimate. Mm. So I think we have uh, to analyze uh, this issue on both sides. You, you're actually going to do it in about 27 different different ways, because you're going to end up doing it by stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there will, so I mean, the easiest way to divide stakeholders is internal, external. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but you all know that that's that's way too simplistic because you're going to have different. And so that was why I was suggesting, for that one at least, because it's going to go in phases. Different things are going to happen over time as you go through the process, trying to build that legitimacy, building toward the election. That she may want to divide up, if you will, her sub-communication goals by each of those. But you're absolutely right. They're going to be subdivided. Either you can do it internal, external, or I would argue you're going to do it by stakeholders, which will, when we get to that point, may make more sense. So if it doesn't, ask me again. Yeah, no. uh, by saying uh, internal and external, I mean uh, internal stakeholders and uh, external stakeholders. Right, right. I, all I'm suggesting is that's too broad a division, uh -huh. and you need to subdivide those. Uh -huh. That's all. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's a gazillion ways you, generally, when you hear the term internal versus external, internal means in inside the organization that's trying to achieve the strategic effect, and external is outside that organization. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're talking about trying to create a legitimate election in Iraq, who's internal? People of Iraq? The people who are trying in the government, the the, 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 the election. I mean, I mean, it, 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 there's it's a there's a gazillion of them, right? And and so that that's the only reason I'm suggesting that internal external sometimes is too broad a division. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, not to want to go back to the internal external thing, but there are about two dimensions to that. The internal one can also be. Uh, the electoral body itself, sure. right? Mm -hmm. um, within the work that the same internal communication amongst them to let them understand the importance of the elections, mm -hmm. right? And what the outcome is in terms of the matrix, 100% participation. But the more important one, slightly even more important, I think, would be the external part. It has to do with voter, educa voter education on two mm -hmm. fronts. One, to um, educate the voter about the electoral process itself, because they are the ones participating uh, in the process, and it's their participation that will legitimize the process, and it's the outcome of their participation that allows you to do the matrix and the assessment. The other part is for the voter, uh, for the voting public to have um, faith in the uh, legitimacy of the electoral uh, institutions. There are two things on the external front: one, voter education, as you know, there's a fairly standard template to get them to vote, and the process of voting. Mm -hmm. But the second and equally important is to get them to understand that, <coughs> that the institution that is managing the election is indeed in itself fair and credible. Right. No, I mean, that's why I suggested that this, when, 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 when moving to actually working on this, you're going to have to phase it. And, 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 I, and when I say phase it, I don't mean linearly phase it, like first we'll do this and then we'll do this. I mean serially and back and forth and up and down, but you're going to have to pull the pieces apart. And if I ever get to um, stakeholder analysis, I'll explain why. Yeah. I also think that the communication should be done by yourself so you can involve other people also to communicate. For example, you could get international observers to. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the international observers might be part of your communication strategy because they're going to provide some of that 
that credible evidence that it was. So, yeah, yeah, by the way, when we talk about the strategic communication plan, we are not talking about something that the communicator is sitting in his or her office and doing, okay? I mean, when we talk about a strategic communication plan, we, we like to have a communicator in the room um, talking about the strategic communication plan, and then we like to see people from a variety of, of elements within the overall organization because you need all of that um, uh, knowledge and experience. And then the other thing that we like to have is a leader in the room because so much of this is leader-centered. When um, the easiest way to kill a, a strategic communication culture is for the leader to ask when is being presented with anything, yeah, but what are our messages? far, far better if the leader says, how do you know that? Mm -hmm. what, what do you know about the stakeholders? As, as Patty said, we're evidence driven. We're very data driven. So the first thing we do is we identify stakeholders. So you'll notice that neither Patty nor I has used the term audience. And, and that's because we don't believe that the English, at least, and I don't speak any other languages, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, but the English term audience is a passive group of people, right? Audiences don't give, the only thing an audience can do is maybe applaud, maybe throw a tomato or two, but audiences are passive. They are something you do something to. Stakeholders, on the other hand, are people who have a stake in the outcome of what the organization is trying to do. And stakeholders can be your foes. They can be the people who don't want you to succeed. So the notion of audience <coughs> says that I only have to pay attention to the people I want to talk to. Right? Well, that's not a good idea. You need to be looking at everyone who has a stake in this including those who are working hard to see you fail. Because you've got to take that into account. Make sense? So the other phrase we don't use is target audience, which is what the military uses. And I just think that people who are trying to persuade pe people of something, uh, who have really big guns, should talk about the people they're trying to persuade as targets. It just doesn't strike me as a good way of doing things. So you identify the stakeholders, and then you analyze them. Now, eventually, you're going to be using data to confirm that you've identified, that you've figured out all the stakeholders and your initial analysis. But what we have learned is that if you get a broad enough group of people together who understand the strategic effect who understand what, what the organization is trying to achieve, have some history around the organization, that you can actually move pretty far, pretty fast. And then you can go and confirm that what you've come up with is right. So if we go to the next slide, um, where this is the model that we use for analyzing stakeholders. Now, I want to, to pause here just for a minute because Ed used a similar diagram, but for a somewhat different purpose. We're not looking to identify free riders, and we're not necessarily looking at the size of those groups, and we will explain why as we go along. So what this is, when you have, when you have um, a two axes, it's called a two by two um, matrix. matrix, thank you. A two by two matrix, okay? Um, you're not allowed to get out of graduate school unless you can use two by two matrices. And there's always something different as you saw, saw in the one yesterday, okay? So there's no, there, there's no rule about these. They're just, two, they're just a tool to look at groups of things by two different issues. Okay? We're looking at it by attitude. Are they for us or against us? And impact. And impact is how 
big of an influence, an impact, can they have on our ability to achieve our goal? All right? And because I like alliteration, they all start with A's. So advocates are high impact and high positive. All right? So they can, they can really have a, they can really help make this happen, and they are completely on our side. All right? Allies are on our side, but they have no impact. So whatever, either by organizational position or for some other reason, but they're on our side. It's good to have, it's good to have them, but they may not in and of themselves have a lot of, of leverage, what we're trying to achieve. Antis are the negative equal to allies. They don't have a lot of impact, but they're negative. And then adversaries are high impact and low attitude. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you so you start to sort of see how you can can start to look at your various stakeholder groups. So what you would have done at this point is you would have done a, a, some kind of a brainstorming activity with your with your group. Um, so when we do it, we are big on little stickies. And we get them in different colors, and sometimes we'll give each person a different color and write down as many stakeholders as you think we've got, and then go put them up from where you think they are. And out of the discussion is where the value comes. Sometimes the group will just make a whole long list, and then each person will go take a different color and put them down, and sometimes you'll find somebody's made somebody an advocate, and somebody else has made them an adversary. Sometimes you'll, they'll do it by organization, and then they have to, they'll say like, well, Annenberg is a high advocate. Well, yeah, but then you've got to sort of pull Annenberg apart. And maybe this professor is an advocate, and this professor is an adversary. So you have to start mm -hmm. drilling down. Is this a map of the uh, strategic communication or the map of the institution? Not, uh, it's your stakeholders. So if you take the Iraqi, if you take, all your stakeholders, if you take the Iraqi election commission now, it has very low legitimacy. Um, but its goal is to have high legitimacy. So with your stakeholders, would you be okay. measuring what, what, we'll get there. what they? One of the things that you want to remember is that these are all time bound. All right, so what you're doing when you are figuring this out, because you're going to be working on your communication plan, you want to know where people are now. And we'll talk in just a minute about how you move them. Um, I, I neglected to say something. Patty kind of hit it at it, and, and it may help if I make it more explicit. Um, communication is an interpretive process. So if I say to you, I want you to think about a dog, okay? I want you all to think about a dog. Louise, what, what comes to mind? Dalmatian. A Dalmatian. Not sure. Not sure. Okay. Who else? Oh, a friend. A friend? Oh, oh, the dog is a friend. Okay, I'm, I'm sort of going for a picture of a dog, but I, I, I can look at that. Um, what else? A pit bull. A pit bull. Labrador. A Labrador. Ender. Ender. Uh, it's a little dog that's very hyper. Um, what did you say? A barking. Okay. So, she, so her image is a barking, noisy dog. Okay. So if I say, if Patty's, and, and Patty would come up with her dog whose name is Gorby, and Gorby is? A poodle. That's about this big. <laughs> sort of looks like a mop without a handle. And um, so. Hey, I used to have a poodle. It's a great dog. I didn't say that. Was a dog. Okay, here's the point of the story. If I said to you, a strange dog jumped on me today, it's going to be a much different story if it's your snarling, barking dog, if it's your pit bull, or if it's Corby, right? Now, we can have a whole conversation about the strange dog that jumped on me. And until we start to get some clarity on what that dog was and looked like and big and, you know, was this a cute little jumping or was I in danger of losing a leg? Um, <laughs> We're actually not communicating successfully, are we? So success, so communication is the stimulating of meaning, right? 
I say something and you get some, you know, you, it has some sort of meaning for you, right? Successful communication is shared meaning. Mm -hmm. Is Eric going to talk about some of his new stuff about that? Probably. Um, okay. So Eric will take you on a whole other direction on that. Eric Eisenberg when, on, Friday. on Friday. But for our purposes today, you know, that it, it's kind of nice if when I say dog, we know what we're talking about. But in English, there is no such thing as dog. Right? There are, are breeds of dogs, sizes of dogs, colors of dogs, right? Because a Labrador and a pit bull are both dogs, but trust me, people, they are not the same. Okay? So, so dog is kind of a, is a sort of a generic term that doesn't necessarily trigger the same meaning in our minds. Right? All with me? Now. If I am creating a strategic communication plan, what's going to be important? My perception of dog or you as my stakeholders' perception of dog? Yes. I am completely irrelevant. And so the phrase that we use, so you all heard, you've heard the term perception is reality? That what we perceive is what a reality is? Well, for an organization, Stakeholder perception is your reality. So what we're really focusing on, and this is the long-winded answer to the question, to Jackie's, question. to Jackie's question, what we're focusing on here is stakeholders' images, uh, influence, and attitude. So what, what's their perception, if you will? What kind of dog are they seeing? You think... You're being a poodle, and they're seeing a pit bull. Yeah, that wasn't the world's best analogy, but you get it. Yeah. Students are trying to change the perception because you don't know exactly what their perception is. Oh, that is so perfect. Hold that thought, because you're going to find out. Yeah, uh, my problem has to do with the categorization of these uh, advice. Uh, okay. The reason being that you may have a strategic, I mean, a group of stakeholders who may not necessarily be, depending on the type of goal you want to achieve, may not necessarily advise you, and may not be anti. Oh, yeah, yeah. It could easily be people right here in the middle that either don't know anything about it or don't care. I mean, one of the things that, you know, in the United States, we would never say our goal is 100% <laughs> because no one wants to live with constant failure, right? <laughs> we're, we're happy if we get 35, you know? Really? Uh, all, you, all you have to do is say, we got a lot of people who don't know and don't care and also have no idea what the word apathetic means, right? But in this moment, my question is, you may have a particular strategic goal that you want, you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. But you may not really have people being against the whole idea. It's about the strategy and achievement. Okay, that's, that's, so, that's, that's what you're looking at. So you're looking at the right. strategy. You're not looking at the goal. You're looking at the strategy. Okay. It can vary from situation to yeah. situation. I mean, but you're trying so to what? achieve something. Mm -hmm. And where are people today around what you're trying to achieve? I mean, that's, that's the short. That's the short thing there. Now, your name, I'm sorry? Chica. Chica is um, asked, how do you know? So let's go backwards. Um, the answer is you do research and you listen to them. So you, we are very data driven. So we believe that when you are doing stakeholder analysis, although you may start with your perceptions, of where those stakeholders are, now you need to go find out if you're right. Mm -hmm. And so there's a variety of ways you do it. The way, where, how do we do it in the United States, do you think? Opinion polls. We do opinion polls. I mean, we do opinion polls about everything and we do them all the time. Um, you could, you know, part of what um, Francois and his team started to do when, it, when they started to do the Twitter analysis of the debates and such, was to try to uh, try to get some stakeholder research, and then of course discovered that 
you, there was data and it, real information there, but it wasn't easily gotten to. You couldn't just look at what was happening in Twitter land during the debate and reach any, any defensible conclusions. But you could once you've done all the things that he was showing you. Um, but what you want to do is, is identify what are stakeholder perceptions. One of the things you have to look at is, have we done something like this before? And what happened? So if there had never been an Iraqi election, okay, um, you wouldn't have to deal with historical perceptions. So because, so it's a little bit like, I trusted you once. Yeah, let me down. Okay? So if there is history around what you're trying to do, or and even if you believe that the old thing bears no resemblance to what we're trying to do today, if your stakeholders believe it's the same, is it the same? Yes, yes it is the same, because your stakeholders believe it's the same. Yeah. Okay, are you with me? So, I think the refrigerator is just fine if you can close the doors, okay? If, you, if I can put stuff in the refrigerator and I can close the doors, that refrigerator is fine. Okay, not my husband, who is an engineer and retired. It's a bad combination. <laughs> so he will say, Rebecca, come here. Oh, yes, come here. He'll open the refrigerator. And he goes, look at that. And I'm going, yeah. And he goes, it doesn't bother you, does it? Not only does it not bother me, I don't know what's bothering him. And it's because I put the who knows what on this shelf instead of on that shelf, like they were labeled. Okay? So his perception is this is a messy, sloppy, terrible refrigerator. And my perception is, did the door close? It's fine. Okay? So here's the thing that you've got to remember. We're not talking fact and truth. Okay? Is it we're talking perception? We're talking interpretation. And where organizations run into trouble is believing that there really is truth. And there is one truth, and it is ours. Because what do, you, what do your stakeholders believe? Their perception, their truth. And if you go, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kind of go back, but if you go back to the two by two, guess what? If I had 47 different X's on that, I probably have more than 47 perceptions of truth. Okay, so you're all with me? So that's why this is, it, it, it's harder than just deciding what your messaging is going to be. Right? But you have a much better chance of achieving your goal. But it but there's work to be done. Alright? So now, one of the things that's important here is that lots of people, when they get right down to it, discover they have no research. Okay? That for the stakeholder groups they've decided are the most important, <coughs> that they know relatively little about them. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to start saying, Okay, how did this happen? How did it happen that we have this, you know, giant important stakeholder group and we really only have our opinions about them and that we have no actual research? And so going through this process is not just about the communication plan, it's also in some ways opening up windows on decision making and leadership in the organization. It's gonna it's gonna come back and this that's why this is so valuable, because yes, we're doing it in the context of the communication plan, but you can see, as Patty's saying, it's gonna have tremendous impact on what you're trying to do with your strategic effect. You may decide that you've got the wrong strategic effect for where you're, what you're trying to, what you thought you wanted to achieve once you discover some of this. You may discover that, yeah, that's a really good ultimate effect that we want to achieve, but we've got 16 different things we're gonna to have to get through before we can achieve 100% voter turnout and legitimacy. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, Michael and Natalia mentioned this. Um, 
Basically. What, we haven't given you a knife? <laughs> 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 I'm going to have to take a research part of it. And, and I want to go back to the first slide I talked about. Remember the one with concentric circles? Yeah, mm -hmm. that one. That there's a space between the environment and the culture, the mild, you know, real life experience that are categorized under a mindset. As a psychological framing of perception, right, that has to be factored in mm -hmm. when you're doing your stakeholder Absolutely. research. And it might vary from culture to culture. Absolutely. Right? Definitely. And it is one of those classic nature or nurture arguments to some extent. But it's a very powerful uh, 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 barrier to really begin to understand uh, the underlying basis for how and why people perceive the reality. Oh, look, if we're talking about Iraq and we're talking 100% voter turnout. So the question is, uh, how do you, you know, in that matrix, factor in the peculiar mindset? Um, okay, so you don't, that's not what you're, what you're doing here is you're just sort of trying to figure out, are they for us or against us? Are they going to have a lot of influence or less? Well, influence? sometimes, sometimes they, they themselves, I mean, you might not be able to read I don't know if anyone has had this experience. We are not quite sure oh. whether they're for you or oh, okay. against so you. Okay, so let's go back to the there's whole just, There's just a sense that somehow, you know. That's why you're going to do the research. Um, the other, the one point that I want to make, we haven't even gotten to it yet, is this is our environment mm -hmm. piece, and and so we've got you know, what's the risk if we don't achieve? What are the barriers that are going to get in the way? What's the situational analysis? Um, who do we have to collaborate with? All of that is going to come together for when you start to figure out what am I going to do. <coughs> so, um, what we're and trying yeah. mm -hmm. to really specifically to answer that question, it's also important that you realize that we can do that sort of cognitive level. Mm -hmm. You can do it here and you do it here. Because one of the things that you see when you're doing stakeholders is that oftentimes these are affinity groups and that psychological mindset is perhaps what created a partnership. That's why these people are working together or something like that. So you can do that kind of analysis and it can be an individual, it can be a group, it can be a partnership, it can be an organization. So that particular element might cut across all of those areas. So this is slightly humorous to uh, take on that, but back to your famous dog, right, beating on you. What would happen if your stakeholder group was a bunch of uh, dyslexics? And for them... It's God. It's God. So a strange God jumped on my lap yesterday. There are just so many no, no, strange variables that you so, can't, so here's the bad I mean, I, news. The reason why I'm saying this is because I, I, don't, I don't want to get a sense of certitude in all of those Okay, areas. and I don't want you to. So here's the bad news. With all of this, you're only going to have a better chance. Okay. You're not going to have a guarantee. The guarantee I will give you is that if you don't do this, your odds of achievement are significantly less. But the more of this that you can do, the better, the more you learn about your stakeholders, okay, and it's right, written really large, the more you learn about them, the more knowledgeable you're going to be about what their perceptions are and what you need to do. And, and I'll talk more about that part when I get here. But so now you see we've, we've identified our stakeholders, we've done an initial analysis, and we're beginning this process. But we also, so generally we go from here to here to here. But to do a really good, thorough strategic analysis takes resources, it takes time, it takes people, right? So before you get do that, give me one sec, before you do that, you may want to go to risk analysis. And the risk analysis here is, what's the risk to the organization if we don't achieve the strategic effect? So if the risk to the organization is not tremendous, life on this planet will go on, but we, we would like to achieve this, but it's not life-threatening, then you might do what we call a quick and dirty. You get a bunch of people together in a room for two days, three days, and you say, okay, we're just going to use whatever knowledge is living in this room and that we can get on the internet really fast. And you go through the process. So your understanding is it ain't perfect, 
but it's a quick and dirty, and since our risk to the organization of failure isn't great, it's probably all that's worth doing. However, the risk to the organization of failure is huge, then that says, okay, this becomes a priority, we're gonna put our scarce resources here, and that's what we're gonna, we're gonna look like. Um, there are lots of organizations that use a metaphor <coughs> that Sheena was using only a little bit differently. They talk about the water line in making this decision, only it's not an iceberg, it's a, you know like a big cruiser ship. It's something with a lot of people on it, and the notion is, are you above the waterline with your decision, or are you below the waterline with your decision? If you're above the waterline and, you know, something happens, you'll be fine. Below the waterline, the ship could sink and all these people will die, right? <laughs> so that's the concept around risk analysis. You had a question. Uh, yeah, even if you're not done with all the requirements, I'd like to know, do you have any information on how this process it will end when you when you it will end when the pressure to start to communicate is bigger than your ability to manage it and to continue the analysis. So um, I mean so look, let me let me say something. Um, this is not the creation of a plan. This is a process. So you are actually working this as you're going. Now, so I'm going to give you an example. Have any of you had a chance to travel around the US? Any of you been to Yellowstone National Park? It's in the middle of nowhere, which we call Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. <laughs> but it is, it, is the, it is the first national park it is the size of three states on the East Coast. It has what we call, we're called bison, but Americans call buffalo. Um, it has wolves, it has coyotes, it has eagles, it has um, everything except a glacier. And it's just an extraordinary place. Um, and, um, and Yellowstone, um, when it snows, is completely snowed in, okay? I mean, big snow, you know, and they only plow a little tiny bit. So the people who want to play in the park in the wintertime are people who, go, who are on snowmobiles or a, a bus, it's called a snow coach. But, and, um, and so those are, the, those are the people who live nearby, those are the sports people, they want to come and just go everywhere, right? Let's see if we can chase some buffalo, that would be fun. And then you have the environmentalists who basically think that nobody should be there ever, right? And it's certainly not in the wintertime, right? Because you make all this noise and you, you upset the animals and such like that. Wake up the bear is bad to wake up a bear. Um, so the park had to come up with a rule about how they would manage the park in wintertime. So in the, in the, simplest, in the simplest equation, they have to balance letting people in and protecting the park, okay? So, um, Gail Thomas and I went to the park and did a two-day strategic communication workshop for the entire senior staff. And Gail worked on um, the project with them on winter use. That's what this is called. The, um, they began the process of figuring out what are we going to do around changing this because what the goal here is not to go to court. And, and by the way, it, for five years, it, there's been fights over this thing. So I mean, this is not a simple process and, and there's lots of animosity and such. What they did was they decided, first of all, that they were gonna base it on science and rather than do it on the number of vehicles, they were gonna do it on sound events. And, they, and the scientists came up with an equation between X number of snowmobiles and a snow coach. Not that important. But what they did was they started to analyze um, using a methodology called content analysis, which Patty will explain, that, um, that looked at all of the communication that was going on in the states and in the communities around this topic. And they started to analyze it. 
And then they started to say, okay, what are our responses to this? And they would go out into the community and do the various things that they would do. And there, there, there were three women who worked on this project, and they were taking copious notes. And then they would come back, and they would start to analyze who said what and what they said, and what how did that change from last time when we gave this message, and they started to build it. But they're doing it all around the stakeholders. And then as the stakeholders move, they're moving. So they're going through all of this all at the same time. So they did sort of an initial pass based on history. So it's not a plan that you write up and now you start to implement it. It's a process. But you're always coming back to your stakeholders and you're always coming back to your environment. What's happened? What's changed? So the upshot of all of this is we may actually get a rule, a rule that will stick. And they just had the big announcement of the new rule and in the first four weeks there had only been 11 comments. Yeah, usually in the first four weeks there's thousands of comments, which means that they're starting to hear. So it was a long-winded way of demonstrating, I don't want you to think of this as a plan, I want you to think of it as a process. But, um, but you're going to be working the implementation, but you're always staying grounded in what's the perception of our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we are talking about these uh, process elements, uh, I think we are talking about uh, an organization which exists already. What if they, we have a new organization? What is going to change? Uh, about Got a strategic the, effect? No, in terms of uh, stakeholder research, uh, stakeholder analysis. Okay, so give me an example. Uh, I can give an example. For instance, for I work for the UN peacekeepers. Uh, 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 the, the so you have an easy job. Uh, no. It's not an easy job yeah. because we are not well accepted. Okay. And uh, we have, for instance, uh, one security uh, security council resolution establishing a new mission, let's say in Mali. Okay. And uh, we need to to set up our office in Mali. Okay. So how are? We What's your strategic effect? The strategic effects uh, we have uh, within the, the, the UN Security Council resolution. Okay, no, okay. Uh, you've got a resolution saying that you're uh, going to. For instance, to they can say we are we are going to support the governance. We are going to support security forces in Mali. We are going, for instance, to okay. to support the rule of law. Those are the, the key. Okay. Strategic so you want to take that strategic effect down a level mm -hmm. to to doing this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so for, for just for purposes of discussion, let's say that the, the um, that you that the peacekeeping I'm going to use all the wrong words, so forgive me. In Mali, is is accepted as the rule of law. Okay, so they are the rule of law. So, what's the communication effect going to be? So they are the rule of law. I'm not sure that's a great one, but, we'll, but for, for purposes of this. So you've got a communication effect which says that they have credibility. That's not a great communication effect. Uh, but that's not the point I'm trying to get to. What I'm trying to get to is even though the organization doesn't exist, you still have stakeholders. Yeah. Right? And there are already opinions about the UN. Oh. Right? right. So and you, you'll get partners. You will find people who can help you. I mean, one of the things that we do for the government, along with Gail, who's in the pink in the in the, the back there, wave Gail. Say hi, Dr. Todd. <laughs> <Hello. laughs> one of the things that you're doing is you're often working with groups who are going into a brand new place that they've never been before. So you'll get a group that is a joint force group to the Horn of Africa or someplace because all of a sudden you've got all these people who want to deal with Somali pirates, okay? You're going somewhere to do something, some kind of peacekeeping, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are already opinions mm -hmm. about Americans, about the American military, about local police and Somali pirates, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can get that information from from partners, and so you, when you're setting up a new organization, you'll have to do some things on your own, but you should make liberal use of what already exists. And, and, and here's the reason for that. Um, 
there are no blank slates, except for maybe a brand new little baby. Okay, so just because your organization has never existed in Mali, doesn't mean that there aren't already a gazillion perceptions about it. And so, um, and, and that's the point. So you need to find out what those perceptions are. Because what is our tendency as an organization to say? Well, it's not us. We haven't been here before, right? But, it, you, you what's bear the, the burden of all the people who've been there before you doing something similar. It's the transitive property. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so you know, you, you know, you are you. I have decided that you are like this. You are like this thing here. This is how I felt about this thing. This is how I feel about you. Now that could be a good thing sometimes, right? Sometimes you get a positive halo effect. But a lot of times it's not so positive. All right. <laughs> so, and you did you have a question earlier? <coughs> She wanted to know how long it took it, so that's what. So she took me all the way to Yellowstone and back. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 uh, at the World Bank, we have a project called Terra Africa, and it's about sustainable life management. And a lot of our communication campaign uh, is to go in faraway villages and explain to people what is climate change. But it's a concept. Can you come to the United States and do that? Hmm? Can you come to the United States and do that? <laughs> like in my language, climate change to explain it, I'll have to go through, you know, a whole speech to explain it. And sometimes maybe we go to a country like Burundi, where the whole country speaks one language, or you go to Cameroon, where every five kilometers it's a new language. So the state called analysis is something that can take a lifetime because. Every time the people you meet is the same Absolutely. concept. What, the same what you would, so but what you would try to do there is see to what de what degree can you generalize legitimately? So you can probably think that if it's a village and there isn't a lot of um, communication or what kind of communication technology there might be with others, what are the what might they already think about? climate um, and you might be able to take because they're because they're similar enough from these other places even though they have different languages in their different countries so you, you might look for demographic similarities and then say okay based on that and then you ask questions so um, you might say go in saying okay I think they're gonna fit into, into this box but I'm going to ask some questions to make sure that I'm right. And I have, I have experience now that says, if they're in this box, this, this, and this tends to work. Mm -hmm. yes. so, that, so that's how you do it. In, in Kenya, for example, one of the ways we find was to say that uh, the world has malaria. So we produce a bit of that. But it's just saying the concept like a child who's sick. And it's one of the way where mm -hmm. once you know the 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 set the reference, mm -hmm. I'm switching to French. Then you can only do that with Patty and Francois. You can't do that with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once you know people's frame of mind and how mm -hmm. they have yeah. the concept they have the same, <laughs> then you can explain it the right way. It, 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 it's an ongoing process. Yeah. It, well, okay. Small. So if you go back, I'm sorry. You are Berdine. If you go back to my conversation with Berdine in Yellowstone, it's a process. So you start out with your analysis and figuring some things out and whatever, and then as you go, you're trying things, you're, you're doing research on how that works, you're reordering, you're, re you're changing, you're modifying, and you're, you're constantly doing that. Now, in your case, what you would want to be doing is, is doing that on a large scale. And, t and not losing what you discovered back over here, over here, because we, you also don't want to run into <coughs> the mistake of assuming that everyone is different. You don't want to assume everyone is the same, but you want to start to look for where there might be similarities. Look, the, you've got to do this, you've got to be smart, and, so, and you've got to know when and where and how to cut corners. You just don't want to cut the wrong corners. Okay, so you know sometimes you want to. So you start to see, well, this worked and this worked. Let me try this and see 
if you know, if, if, if this might work here, how I might have to modify it. But remember, think of it as a process. Remember when Manuel Pastor was talking about deliberative dialogue? Mm -hmm. One of the things that the social movement people do is they'll go from a stakeholder research concept and they'll say well, collaborators and then sometimes we turn it over to them and they become empowered, right? That's, the, that's what level of participation means. So now I'm going to go back. We've talked about, I think, all of these things, um, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to help you say, if I'm teaching this to people, this is how we can more systematically talk about it. We purposefully try to make people look at it in a more holistic and a less linear way because the process doesn't work linearly. It really doesn't. It's too iterative. Other things keep coming in. But you can take snapshots. You can look at it at a point in time and say, all right, here we are. This is our stakeholders. This is what we want from our stakeholders. This is how we're going to measure whether or not we are effective by date X, whatever that date is. And then this is how we are engaging them, that level of participation. This is the communication activity that's directly related to each of these stakeholders. And then output measure, this is how we're going to know overall what happened with that communication activity. Right? We will have different kinds of metrics, and I'll go over the different kinds of metrics in the day we do the metrics. And so this is how one would take um, a milestone sort of snapshot. Here's where we are at this point in time. All right? If you are also trying to help people see this in a more systematic way, we again are calling this a thought process. We are not calling it, you know, like steps. But it can be used that way for people who insist on thinking. We don't way. give you a template because because then you'll use it, and there's and that's not where the value is. The value is not in the document. The value is in the thought process. What are the questions that you're asking? Right. So one of the things that we want is we want people to say, okay, we've got a goal or objective. From that, what are the communication goals and objectives? Remember the example of energy, okay? That's not communication, but there are these things that you have to do to make it work, right? This is very critical, because this helps you prioritize. What are the risks if the goals and objectives are not met? And those risks might be somewhat different for different stakeholder groups. Good question. Which goals? It's a strategic goal and communication. Both. Right? You, you are always looking long term. You don't ever lose the long term. But in the intermediate stage, you will often have three or four communication goals that you have to achieve. Right? Good question. I should make sure that we put that on there. I'll change that for the next time we teach this. Situational analysis. That means that what you're doing is you're saying, in this situation, this is how we are going to perceive. This is how we are going to advocate. This is how we are going to dialogue. All of the things are based on the situation. And the situation in the middle of the process could change, right? Situation can change if something big goes wrong. Communication might change if there is a fire. The communication might change after an election. So when you're looking at the situational analysis, you, you, you took a snapshot when you started, what was going on, right? What's the environment and such. As you're going through, you're looking at what were the reactions, what was the effect of the different steps that you've done, and what does that mean in terms of what you've got to do going forward. So your situational analysis is no more static than anything else that you're doing. Right. And even though we keep talking about you start with the stakeholders, that that's your center, and that's, of course, the biggest of our, our little boxes here. But at the same time, you will often learn in the middle of the process that you had a stakeholder that you didn't know about. 
And so stakeholders can shift. And people that you thought were really important, it turns out, are nowhere near as important as people that you didn't even know existed. But the stakeholder is not part of the situational analysis? The situational analysis is never independent of the stakeholders, but it is big context. It's, it's a much bigger context, and it could include things like an economic crisis. Think of your situational analysis as the set in which your stakeholders are acting. Okay. Uh, you can, in a lot of these things, you can think about these as, um, as a film that's unfolding. And you can talk about scenes and multiple scenes and what's happening in that scene. There's a storm in this scene. In this other scene, we've got the aftermath of an election. But you know why you're separating these two? The concept, this whole slide is designed to help us do two things. It's to remember that you always start with the strategic goals and objectives. And it's to help us not forget these other issues and that they're interrelated. Think of these as questions. Uh, what's, what's the risk if we don't achieve our goals? What's the situation in which we're doing this work? Who are our stakeholders? So think of these as questions that you're asking yourself as, you, as you're going through the process, but you never ask it once. You ask them repeatedly as time goes on and you do things, and then you look at the impact or the effect of what you've done, and then you do some more analysis and you go forward. Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a rolling process as opposed to a one-time thing. Right. And one well, of the, that question. Oh, I'm sorry. So will that Changes in your situational analysis will happen, and your uh, stakeholder approval will change. Will that affect your goals as well? It could. If you're lucky, it won't. But it could. It could, as Patty said, it could affect a, an interim. It could create an interim goal that you didn't know you were going to have, or an, um, because maybe what you what you maybe what happened with the situation is you did something, it didn't work out. Now you've got to fix that. And that's going to, and so that's going to be an interim goal. So it could. Um, your overall strategic goal, one would hope, won't change, but it probably does. We have, a, and you know, I was very interested in the, the climate change question because we've got a project where we're looking at climate change across lots of different countries, and one of the things that you discover is that in some places you can't ask people about climate change because the concept doesn't exist, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we discovered that we had an interim goal of helping you know, both ourselves and the people that we were talking to learn to think about this as an issue. Right? And so sometimes, you know, you, you take something that works really well in one context and you move it to another context and you discover that it doesn't work at all. There was a lot of research done about 10 years ago that was trying to make comparisons on carbon footprint in Europe and the US and they discovered that not enough people in the US knew the concept of carbon footprint that you could even do a decent poll on it. And so there, you know, all of a sudden you realize that you've got intermediate communication goals. All right. This chart. There's one more chart. Yes. This chart and the next chart are in some ways designed for people where the puzzle takes too long and it makes their heads hurt. All right. And so you can work your way through this more quickly. And you can help people understand that in each one of these, we're dealing with an analytical thought process, right? Before Patty leaves this slide, because I know we're running out of time, the most important bar on both, on both slides is this one. What are the implications of their perceptions? Because that's what's going to drive what you actually can and cannot do and when you can and cannot do it. All right, so we've talked about all of the things, except I wanted to say one thing about themes. 
when Rebecca was talking about the fact that you might have multiple messages for your different stakeholder groups, it works really well if you can find a thematic umbrella, right? Think of, think of an umbrella and then think of your messages as sort of hanging down, you know, from each one of the spokes on the <coughs> umbrella. If you can fit all your messages under that umbrella, you are way better off than if this message is here and this message is here and this message is there because you don't get the leverage. They don't work toward each other. They tend not to work horizontally if you can't find those things that connect those messages. So even if you've got different messages, if you can find an umbrella theme that ties them all together, it usually works by going up a level of abstraction, right? So my example that we've been using with this um, reform uh, project in Thailand, where we've got something like 27 different NGOs starting to work together, if you were just talking about trafficking, the term trafficking had so many different interpretations. Kind of like dog. You know, across <laughs> all these different groups and what people, you know, were thinking. The, the whole thing about the dog just, you know, it's so, it, it's so wonderful because some of these trafficking people see like Interpol as a savior and other people see Interpol as the bad guy, right? as opposed to the people who are actually pulling people uh, out of Uganda, you know, and dumping them off in Thailand, or the people who are uh, pulling the people coming out of Myanmar, right? Who is the bad guy? It starts to shift. So what do you do? You move up a level of abstraction. How, how might we find a phrase that would go up above all these sorts of differences? Any ideas? We started using human dignity, you know, as one of those phrases that moves up above everything. And that what we wanted was a human dignity umbrella. And it's worked pretty well so far. We'll tell you when we get our metrics back <laughs> how well it's working overall. So. <clears throat> Lots of times the people that we're working with are high, high participation, sometimes our stakeholders are low participation. They show up for focus groups or something like that, right? What then you are trying to do overall as a strategic communicator is you are always trying to build you and your organization's strategic communication capability. So you come in, you've got a new organization, you're not going to have a lot of capabilities right away. But the more you collect the data, the more you engage with people, the more you develop um, an archive where people can find the lessons learned and the knowledge from the previous group so that even when Louisa says, okay, I've done this for a while, I'm gonna go off and I'm going to find you know, my new path through, through life. And Tunji says, I made it through the election. But he's got all this wonderful knowledge. How are you going to leave that knowledge in your organization? And so you can leave it with the people. You can train people. You can leave it by letting people know this worked, this didn't work, and we think this is why. You can build a culture around certain kinds of values. You can embed the communication processes and tools inside your organization. You can figure out who the most likely leaders are, who will succeed you. But structure is always really important, and it's good to have infrastructure things. It's good to have a database. It's good to have, you know, a website where people can click on archive and find lots of previous projects. And the more transparent it is, you know, the better off. What we're going to do as we work through the class, we're going to find all of the ways that strategic communication capability can be enhanced, can be embedded, can be grown, and can be shared. All right? And so that's more or less the framework for how the rest of this material is going to go. So. We